Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here, both on Facebook and on YouTube, as we do our best to entertain, inspire, and enlighten for the next little while. On tap today, COVID-19 and the heart. What research is showing and how a plant-based diet may be able to help. We'll be speaking with a renowned cardiologist whose goal is to prevent heart attacks with forks and knives rather than stents and scalpels. Dr. Columbus Batiste is here with us today. Dr. Batiste, I can't wait to catch up with you in just a couple minutes, my friend. Oh, it's so nice to meet you. I've listened to you for quite some time on the podcast, so it's a pleasure to meet you finally in person. Oh, you humble me, sir. You humble me. <laughs> Looking forward to our conversation and get your questions ready. Dr. Vanita Rahman is also here to answer all questions, all inquiries related to health, diet, nutrition, you name it. When we open up the doctor's mailbag, Dr. Rahman, you ready for a little bit of everything today? Absolutely, Chuck. Good to be here. Love that enthusiasm. So go ahead and drop your questions in the doctor's mailbag right now by posting them in the comment section or chat box, whatever it is that you want to call it. Just bottom line, send in your inquiries and Dr. Rahman will get to as many as she possibly can before the end of the show. But before we get into anything else, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Tuesday, July 28th, 2020. The number of coronavirus cases in the U.S. is expected to top 4.3 million today after nearly 60,000 new infections were tallied Monday. If there is, however, a spot of good news, Reuters is reporting that the rate of new infections declined by 2 percent last week, ending a streak that saw five consecutive weeks of increases. The news, however, more glum for the death toll as COVID-19 related fatalities rose for a third straight week. Data showing 15 states seeing increases in the number of deaths for at least two weeks straight, bringing the nation's death toll to more than 148,000. The overall number of patients hospitalized for COVID-19 also remains near record levels. The coronavirus is killing tens of thousands of children every month, but not in the ways most would expect. The pandemic is causing a sharp increase in the number of hunger-related deaths worldwide, with more than half coming in the sub-Saharan Africa and Yemen regions. Researchers pu research published in the journal Lancet points to the disruption of food trade and the closing of markets, which often are the only lifeline for impoverished families to get food and medicine. The coalition of researchers also warns that malnutrition can have long-lasting consequences, including increased risk of disease down the line, stunted growth, and even a lack of education. In other news, a diet rich in plant-based foods is being shown to be protective against prostate cancer once again. Researchers tracked participants' eating habits, studying how often they ate healthy foods such as fruits and vegetables, and those foods that are more indulgent, such as sweets and dairy and meat. The findings showed those who followed a healthier dietary pattern with an abundance of produce and whole grains were at a lower risk of developing prostate cancer compared to those who indulged in sweets, meats, and dairy treats. More than 12% of men are expected to be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. And finally, with the NBA season about to tip back off, Beyond Meat is partnering with star players Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, and Carmelo Anthony to fight racism through the trio's nonprofit, Social Change Fund. Beyond Meat CEO Ethan Brown says the meat alternative company is dedicated to broader social goals, using what's on the center of the plate as a critical starting point. The partnership will focus on addressing inequalities in nutrition access and health outcomes in America. Moving on, more than 30 million Americans are living with heart disease, and in some ways, you can say that they are the lucky ones, because heart disease is also attributed to nearly 650,000 deaths in America every year, making it the leading cause of death here in the U.S., outpacing all forms of cancer combined, accidents, and yes, even in the pandemic, COVID-19. Yet experts say it is also one of the most preventable chronic diseases and hundreds of thousands of lives can be saved every year if we didn't live in this fast food nation. In just a little bit, I'm going to be joined by someone who is an expert who would rather be treating heart disease in the kitchen rather than the operating room. With that, please welcome the Chief of Cardiology at Kaiser Riverside, Dr. Columbus Batiste. Dr. Batiste, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today, my friend. 
Oh, it's my pleasure. Once again, great to finally meet you and see you in per- see you uh, virtually. I won't say in person, but virtually. <laughs> virtually, indeed. What do we have, like 3,000 miles between us right now? <laughs> um, so in the lead up, I was giving some statistics about heart disease and, and about 650,000 deaths every year. Some experts who I've interviewed on the show say at least half of those cases are completely preventable. As a cardiologist, do you agree with that assessment? Well, it is. I mean, we know that statistically speaking, we know that nearly 80% of the disease burden is preventable. You know, it's a combination, whether or not we're looking at smoking, whether or not we're looking at uh, lifestyle in terms of nutrition, which is obviously uh, uh, the the core component of, of what my intent is, looking at inactivity, those things play such a substantial role in the development and progression of coronary artery disease that starts from childhood all the way through to adulthood. I like to paint with words here. So I'm going to ask for you to put on your verbal paint, uh, your verbal paintbrush here, as it were, and, and walk us through what happens to a person's arteries, both immediately after they eat a Big Mac. And then what are the long-term consequences in those arteries if they eat a Big Mac every single day? Paint that picture for us. What happens inside? Yeah. So, you know, when you have whatever the substance is, whatever the type of 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 a uh, fatty meal that's ultra processed that as i like to characterize it melts in your mouth not in your hands right that when you <laughs> absorb that now all of a sudden your sugar levels rise and because it's likely been repetitive your body is unable to really process that and so your blood sort of turns to sludge so instead of it being highly viscous and it swishing through the vessels now the the vessels the blood coursing through turns to sludge and it's moving very slowly and and very lethargically and the vessels no longer which formerly were may have been able to expand and accommodate according to the needs of increased blood flow that's required now they begin to constrict down so now in that instance as you're eating this food and you start to wonder is this heartburn that i'm feeling uh, this indigestion that you're feeling and the question really arises is that indeed heartburn or is that your heart burning from the the ill effects of the food that you've given and that you've had and so now as the endothelium that special lining that super superhero type of lining that encases the vessels to protect it becomes damaged it constricts down once it constricts that diminishes blood flow and may bring about symptoms of of uh, what we call ischemia or lack of blood flow to the heart muscle that women will present differently. They may feel fatigued. They may feel some back discomfort. They may feel nauseated or a little bit dizzy. Or you may get the prototypical symptoms that have typically been characterized in men of that crushing chest discomfort called Levine uh, 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 syndrome that you have with the hand over the heart, the jaw, the neck, and so forth, breaking out in a sweat. And these are the things that pretend itself towards a heart attack. Now. The key thing is most times folks think that, oh, it must be a blockage of 70, 80, 90% that lead to a heart attack occurring. And I tell people all the time, it's not the 70, 80, 90% that lead to heart attacks. It's a 10, 20, 30, 40%. Those areas of disruption, of placking, of mild erosion that would never show up on an EKG. They would never show up on a stress test. They would never show up on an echocardiogram, but these areas become unstable. And then in that moment now, either it's because of stressors of life, it's over the stressors and fear of COVID or of social unrest, or perhaps it's from this food that we've taken on to comfort ourselves, this quote unquote comfort food, that now we destabilize this small area, then then it erupts and it explodes. Just like a pimple on the outside, this happens on the inside. This eruption then leads to the cascade of events that shuts the vessel down in a moment. You, you just mentioned uh, social unrest. You mentioned COVID. Uh, then we've got everyday stressors that certainly have not gone anywhere. That kind of presents a triple whammy in terms of stress. Would you say that yeah. by and large right now that we need to be taking better care of our hearts now more than ever? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's one thing. So many may have a perfect dietary intake, but they're stressed beyond belief. And so what we've seen during this time of COVID is that there is a condition called takosubu, 
stress-induced cardiomyopathy that happens from this unrelenting surge of stress hormones due to emotional stressors that you may have from the loss of, of life, the loss of loved ones, the loss of a pet, different things like that. But even we look at the loss, we're grieving over the loss of normalcy, not being able to congregate like what we used to, not being able to have that social interaction. And so many people are suffering. And as a result, studies have shown an increase in what we're calling stress-induced heart attacks. So our mind and body are connected. And so it's it's the stressors that we, we experience from day-to-day -day interaction then are compounded by what I like to call nutritional stressors, right? That we're in a nutritional stress is not just eating food that's unhealthy. It's not eating food that is healthy. So it's also the absence of eating health promoting foods. So oftentimes I get, I hear people all, all the time in my clinic and in the community, they say, doc, I don't eat this. I don't eat that. I don't eat the other. Well, what do you eat for your health is equally as important in the process. I want to uh, focus specifically on COVID-19 right now. Yesterday, we had Dr. Kim Williams on the show, and he said something that I found was really interesting. We hear about the racial disparities in the outcomes of COVID-19 patients and the risk uh, disproportionately affecting African-Americans and, and minorities. But what Dr. Williams told me was that it's really based off his research and what he's seen, it's risk and not race. And what he meant by that is if the playing field were absolutely leveled, you would not see this health disparity. He said, if anything, being African-American offers a slim margin of protection against COVID-19. Is that accurate in your opinion? So I, I, I'm not certain I've, I'm up to speed with what research he's quoting. But what I can tell you is that 2020 has really uncovered America's very little secret. And it's exposed what I call is the fact that America as a whole is living sicker and dying sooner than other industrialized countries. And we know this based off of historical data and epidemiological data looking at our outcomes. But within this subset of, of this powerhouse nation on the, glo on the global stage, within the subset, we have a core group of individuals who are black and brown who have stark health disparities that have been persistent throughout the, the eons of time. And so what is uncovered is the fact that yes, those people who are black and brown tend to die sicker and sooner from heart attacks, diabetes, stroke, um, et cetera, is what is, it's distinctly exposed. Now, the real question is why? It's why. Oftentimes we look at it as just fact. Okay, this, the sky is blue, the sun is yellow, it's warm outside, you know? Um, but the question is really why? Why do these health disparities exist? And so it's more, very complicated when you really get dive into the health disparities as to why they exist. It's, some of it is historical, some of it is a systematic type of, 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 of situations that have occurred over the eons. Some of it's access. It's what we globally characterize as social determinants of health. It's the environment that lends itself to culture, that lends itself to the food that's available, that lends itself to increased stressors that all, all boil in this crucible that pretend itself to disease. And I think that COVID has really uncovered it. So when you look at COVID in its interplay, as far as in attacking the endothelium, I know we're gonna jump into that, and how that is tied to basically all the disease burdens of Alzheimer's to, to uh, diabetes, to high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, that's where the problem lies. Um, so I'm not, I'm not certain about the research, but those are some of the things that we know and that I've looked at and there, there's clear clarity in terms of what's been shown in, in literature and what we're seeing in this 2020 short time. Well, let's talk about the way that COVID does, in fact, attack the heart. There was a study published uh, just this week in JAMA Cardiology uh, that tracked, I believe, 100 patients and showed that the vast majority of them, uh, these were patients between the ages of 45 and 53, and the vast majority, more than three quarters, showed some sort of inflammation uh, in the heart muscle and the lining there. What do we know about the way that this disease is, in fact, attacking the cardiovascular system? Well, I think that's one thing we know is we know that it's evolving our knowledge and our understanding of COVID and its process and the way in which it's really, um, really attacking the body. But one of the hypotheses that have been set forth, in addition to the ACE 
receptors and we're looking at the endothelium is that this seems to be an entry point. And so for those in the audience who may be unfamiliar with Dr. Esselstyn's beautiful rendition of how the endothelium is so profound and it, it works in, uh, on the body and protects, the endothelium is that inner lining, it's the inner skin that lines all of the vessels. And so I like to call it, it's almost like a Teflon pan, although many of us perhaps aren't using Teflon pans as much, but nothing sticks to it when it's intact. It's completely impermeable and it prevents things from attacking, but it gets worn just like that Teflon pan over time. And now folks who are out there who maybe haven't risen to the knowledge of awareness may spray, start with Pam, and then may add oil onto that, that cooking pan in order to, to still cook. Your endothelium, as it gets worn, it now becomes permeable and it, becomes in, it has the potential to become inflamed. And so the whole process of atherosclerosis, right, that's the invagination of this fatty material is an inflammatory process that occurs. And so what studies are showing is that this COVID virus attaches to some of the receptors, which is why hypertensive patients are susceptible, but also it goes and tracks through the endothelium. And that's what leads to a lot of the events. Um, then when, when folks really uh, succumb to this diffuse event that leads them into the hospital, we know this is a diffuse inflammatory response that typically occurs. And so it's all connected it really is all connected in terms of what's transpiring. You know, what I find interesting is that the COVID is also attacking people who are, you would think at least are relatively physically fit. You, the case of Boston Red Sox pitcher Eduardo Rodriguez just yesterday announced that he was going to be shut down for a period of time because he has a heart condition that they believe was brought on by COVID-19. Uh, he's hoping to be back in the lineup next week. To me, that seems like a quick turnaround, but what do we know as far as how quickly a person can actually reduce inflammation around the heart, uh, whether it's COVID related or not? Is that too aggressive of a timetable to get back on the playing field? You know, it's hard because everyone's such an individual, but that's one that brings up, you bring up a great point, which is just even in asymptomatic individuals, we're seeing that the lungs are showing manifestation of scarring or issues of impairment, even when someone seems as if they're, they're asymptomatic. We're finding that heart patients too as well, or patients are having just as you point, true to point, areas of inflammation or weakening of the heart muscle. And these are releasing what we call troponin values, which are essentially markers that denote the protein specific for an organ system. This one in, as it pertains to the heart are being released. So the timetable in, in terms of healing or recovery is really it's multifactorial. It's going to likely depend upon how much of a hit his heart took, how strong it is, how strong it, it isn't, how high his markers went, um, the level of concern, what type of imaging they've done, all those things will, will play a role in whether or not he's having symptoms of discomfort or shortness of breath. But it's hard, you know, obviously, to give general recommendations for someone we haven't um, directly spoken with. And, but I think the key thing is trying to protect ourselves from really contracting it, the, the COVID virus, because it can really negatively impact us. And I think that's one of the key things that you brought up is that someone who appears healthy appears strong, you think, well, they can't possibly get it. We never know what's brewing underneath the surface. And all of us are in a constant warfare against illness versus wellness, you know, and we, we, this has been well delineated in terms of cancer and, and with prior reports saying 40% of women by the age of 40 have precancerous breast cancer cells floating around and 50 to 60% of men have pre prostate cancer cells floating around and nearly a hundred percent by the age of 70, 80% will have thyroid type cancer cells around our bodies in this constant warfare. And so the foods that we eat, our mindset, all those, our activity, all play a unique role in trying to arm ourselves. Uh, let's talk generally here about uh, heart inflammation. Uh, you are a guy who would much rather be treating heart disease in the kitchen than in the operating table or operating room, I should say. Um, in terms of effectiveness in, in treating heart disease inflammation, how effective is a plant-based diet compared to the standard forms of treatment? Yeah, no, I, I think that what we know, we first of all, we don't have head-to-head -head comparisons and it depends on what question we're truly asking. So that's a very useful question, but I'll break it down a little bit further. One is in the realm of an, the throes of an acute heart attack, right? So in the, the form of an acute heart attack, I'll analogize that to a blowout on the uh, freeway, 
a tire being blown out on the freeway. There is an issue. There's different degrees from a flat tire all the way out to a, a tire that gets blown out on the freeway that something may have to happen in the immediate instance in order to, to, to troubleshoot and make sure you do tend to that. But then you have individuals where perhaps maybe the air is a little bit low on the tire. Individuals where, you know, they, they tend to drive recklessly over nails and so forth. And we know that there's extreme power in trying to change the habits and trying to take care of those tires to really prevent the tire from blowing out, to prevent the issues from happening on the expressway at that point in time. And that's where I really see the difference. So in the setting of acute heart attacks, um, that is not the immediate timetable to implement a therapeutic plant-based nutrition as a sole means. It's more, it, from my perspective, is meant to be used um, uh, in concert. So it should not, you know, because oftentimes what we see in the work that's been done by PCRM has been incredible, really, in pushing legislation to really try and change the core components of hospital dietary intake becomes extremely important because it makes zero sense to feed patients inflammatory foods that are just going to flame the, the flames of disease and for heart disease after we've gone to take care of and stem the tide of the massive heart attack that's occurring. In the outpatient arena, my stance is, is that I can go ahead. My sole goals are to help you feel better or help you live longer. The vast majority of cases, study after study after study has told us that the stents that many of the bypass surgery in the elective setting are not life-saving, that oftentimes they're symptom alleviating. And so I tell patients, if I can achieve you resolving your symptoms with the least negatively impactful treatment, which means nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, eliminating toxins, that those are the, that's a preferential course because that not only is going to help you from getting an immediate heart attack, but getting that second or third heart attack, because we know about 30 to 35% of heart attacks that occur every single year are from a secondary, a recurrent heart attack that happens. And so that's really the key of treating folks. And so that's what led to not only the lecture series that I put on, but also what we characterize as our, our cath lab. Cath lab is where we take patients to put stents in and to do special procedures. So I coined the term cath lab, cooking alternative to health, as an area in which we do the same thing. We go ahead and our goal is to offset and to prevent a heart attack from occurring and to stop and improve the symptoms from happening. Dr. Patish, you are involved in one of the better projects that I've heard of in a while. Certainly one of the most intriguing, uh, the Slave Food Project. Uh, got a chance to flip through that a little bit last night and again this morning before we, we, we got the opportunity to talk today. Walk us through what this is. I actually think that this is just a brilliant project that you're pulling together here. Yeah. So, no, thank you for that. And I appreciate the words of affirmation and encouragement with it. You know, we were chatting earlier and there's different ways, always different ways to tell the story. And and so this is a different way of looking at the story. And so slave food actually is kind of a double entendre. It, it's really looking at its layered meaning. So not only, yes, there's a historical connotation of slave food where food was given as far as the refuse was given to slaves at that point in time. And they had to kind of build a new culture and a means of, 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 of uh, providing nutrients for themselves. But really slave food is really about an issue of lack of choice, that we all at times are enslaved to our environment, that some are, great, are more enslaved to their environment than others. We call these food deserts and food swamps without the absence of health promoting foods or an overabundance of foods that are deleterious, that we find that folks have the perception that that eating healthfully is expensive because the food is subsidized by the government. And so they feel as if they, they don't really have a choice. We say make a better choice, but all that's around them is their environment that's filled with foods that are disease forming. And so Slave Food is a project that seeks to, ex to explore the relationship between uh, health, uh, 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 food deserts, food addiction, uh, stress, but also looking at the impact of discrimination. That discrimination can be based upon gender. It can be based upon ethnicity. It could be based upon sexual orientation. But these stressors that mount and what studies have shown is that stress alone, which all of us, all Americans face stress, 
that pertains disease. They increase your risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. But there is another layer of stress that it's hard for certain individuals to escape in the form of discrimination that also pertains towards poor health outcomes. And so when we look at that, we know that there's shortened telomeres. And there was a study, interesting study was done from one of the conversations we we're hosting these slave food conversations. And we had an, um, a PhD public health uh, professor come on and he made reference to a study that was done of teenage African-American girls. And they measured the telomeres where their stress was high. They felt the impact, they perceived discrimination. It's not really about whether or not it's real or, or not. It's just if you perceive it. And they measured their telomeres and their telomeres were the same, were shorter actually, than middle-aged women with breast cancer. That's huge. That when you look at the power of the impact of a person's environment and shortening their lives that they live sicker and sooner. But here was the key that was so incredibly hopeful because I think that we have to always look what's the hope, what's the silver lining inside of every story is the fact that when they engage in starting to go ahead and mentor these young ladies, when they start encouraging them and empowering them through uh, and letting them know that they're loved, irrespective of their educational performance of anything else, but just for who they are, they showed that they were able to improve and lengthen, very similar to the work that Dr. Dean Ornish did with Elizabeth Black, uh, Blackburn and showing the extension of telomeres through complete lifestyle change, nutrition, mind, body, um, smoking cessation, and those things are important. And so in my mind that there is hope. So we see, when we say, why is there this health disparity that exists in this country? That is not a black or brown issue. It's an American issue because you look at billions of dollars that are lost as a result of health disparities that get funded and shifted over into issues of dialysis or into heart failure or to various things of that nature, that now you have lost productivity, lost years of earning potential, all these things that get, get um, added on, it's so important for us to look at. And so that's what slave food is about. It's about bringing awareness and bringing attention and cutting through and asking why, as opposed to accepting it just as fact as if there is some sort of, um, DNA. And the key is your DNA is not your destiny. Your DNA is not your destiny that we can transform our epigenes through our nutrition, through our mindset that can impact our microbiome, that can impact our endothelium, that can give us protection to improve our health span. Even if it's not our lifespan, none of us know our beginning from our end, but it's about how can we live on this earth healthier, longer so we can be a value, we can be a purpose. And now that's really the goal of, of slave food. Slave food starts looking at the African-American community, but it doesn't stop there. The next phase of slave food is then looking at other, other communities. And that can go from individuals in the Appalachians, all right? That can go to individuals who are who uh, of the Hispanic Latino, that can be of, of South Asian uh, group and looking at various um, aspects of culture that play a role into this essentially almost enslavement really from their their environment and that's what it's about man what a series what a series i would love to have you back on uh sometime in the future hopefully not too distant future to talk more about it i feel like there is an awful lot still left to discuss with that but you can check that out at slavefood.org dr batiste thank you so much for your time today yeah, it's been a pleasure. Nice to meet you. Finally, it's good to see you. <laughs> Likewise, my friend. Likewise. I heard so much about you before today. It's so it's so great to finally have you on the show. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Batiste. Slavefood.org is the website to go check out that series, a very important one at that. Time now to open, Ramon is here with us in the exam room to answer your questions. So post yours right now in the comments section, and we will get to as many as we can in the next, oh, six minutes or so. Anything diet, health, nutrition related, that is fair game. Dr. Ramon, you still with us? You ready to rock and roll? Absolutely. All right. Here's the first question that comes to us from Brooke on YouTube. She wants to know what are resistant starches and can those found in foods aid in weight loss? Yeah, so this has become sort of a popular topic these days. Resistant starches are a type of carbohydrates that are found in plant foods. And what's 
neat about them is they function almost like fiber in that we cannot digest them. So usually we don't get calories from them, or if we do, it's less than what we'd normally get from carbohydrates. And since we can't digest them, they don't feed us directly. They feed the microbes in our gut, which then in turn play a role in our health. And what's great about resistant starches is that they can improve our gut microbes so they can help our colon be colonized with healthier microbes. They can help reduce blood sugar levels. They could help in weight loss because they leave us feeling fuller. And you may be wondering where you can find them. So they are found in grains, but when we cook grains, the resistant starches are no longer resistant um, to digestion. So for example, oats have resistant starches. So when we cook our oats, we lose them. But if we do something like overnight oats, we can benefit from them. They're also found in legumes and lentils, white beans. So you can sprinkle those on your salad or casserole and get some resistant starches that way. Another trick is once you cook your food, then to cool it, like potatoes or rice, when you do that, the resistant starches stay intact and then we can benefit from them. But um, what's most important to know is that plant foods have them and plant foods are healthier for us for a variety of reasons, not just resistant starches, but also because of the fiber that's found in them. Great question coming up from Richard. He posted this at 1239. He says, I lost 150 pounds with the plant-based mm -hmm. diet. Congrats, man. That's awesome. Uh, but my question is, does the damage to the heart that can occur in the teen years be completely reversed without any signs of damage after eating that way? Wow. That's a, that's a loaded question. First of all, congratulations on the weight loss and good for you for changing your diet and fundamentally changing your health trajectory. So what we know is based on research that Dr. Dean Ornish did and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn did is that it is possible to uh, reverse cardiovascular disease, that disease that forms in the endothelium that Dr. Batiste was just describing. But do we know if we can fully reverse it uh, without causing any problems long-term? We just don't have that kind of research to answer definitively, but everything we have points to the fact that diet and lifestyle play a key role, not only in prevention, but possibly in reversal, because as Dr. Batiste just pointed out, a lot of things that we do in medicine, such as stent or angioplasty or bypass surgery, we're not reversing the disease, we're stabilizing it for the time being. A lot of talk about masks recently. This one comes to us from Edith on Facebook. She wants to know, is it possible to contract a sinus infection from a mask? Hmm. So this is a common concern. First, let's explain what a sinus infection is. So our sinuses sit behind our nose and they can become inflamed. So when we have their little pockets, hollow pockets that have some mucus in them, but so they can become inflamed and sometimes they can become infected. So for example, when it's allergy season and we're walking around, our nose is congested from allergies, our sinuses are inflamed too but it's not necessarily a sinus infection. Similarly, when we are sick with the typical cold, we have it in our nose or throat, and some of it is in our sinuses too. So our sinuses are infected with it, but that's usually not what people mean when they say sinus infection. What they mean is a secondary infection has set in, usually a bacterial infection that's causing inflammation in the sinuses. Now, you know, with COVID-19, we're being urged to wear face masks to protect others and ourselves. And the question is, could this lead to sinus infections? Not, not that we have data indicating that there's, you know, this, there's no reason to believe wearing a face mask increases our risk beyond what we normally would have. So doing the things we always do, washing our hands, um, you know, and the key also here would be to keep those face masks clean. So if you're using a reusable one to wash it frequently, if you're using a disposable one to change it frequently, these can all mitigate the risks because it's not that they directly cause sinus infections, but if they introduce an infection in, through our nose, then that could be a setup for a sinus infection. Next question is about cholesterol. It comes to us from Alina on YouTube. She writes, I've been vegan for three years and oil free. My LDL cholesterol is 100 and I cannot lower that value. 
do you have any advice? Yeah, Alina, thank you for your question. This is something that um, people often struggle with. They're following a plant-based diet. They've gone oil-free, but their cholesterol just isn't getting below 100, their LDL or their total isn't below 150. So a couple of thoughts here. Um, one, we know that while it's important to cut out oil, it's also important to be mindful of other high fat foods in our diet, such as avocados or nuts, because these two contain saturated fat, which can raise our cholesterol levels. So really limiting the amount of avocado or nuts in the diet can be important. Another ingredient is coconut, which is really high in saturated fat, as is chocolate, whether it's dark or vegan, it's really high in saturated fat. So cutting these out can help lower the cholesterol levels too. And um, another important consideration is overall lifestyle, regular exercise, especially cardiovascular exercise, which means vigorous movement for about 30 to 40 minutes without interruption can help lower cholesterol levels. So can maintaining a healthy BMI. So getting that BMI below 25 is really important because one thing we know from research is a higher BMI attenuates the impact that we would see from dietary changes. So really getting all of those pieces to fall into place may be helpful. Final question is about blood pressure medication. This one comes from Jonathan. He writes, my question is, as I go vegan, can I safely eat hemp seed and flaxseed and avocado while still taking Xarelto and blood pressure medication as well as a beta blocker? Yeah. So for those people who don't know, Xarelto is a blood thinner. It's given to people who've had blood clots or may have an irregular heartbeat that predisposes them to blood clots in their uh, heart. And it prevents clots from forming or embolizing to other parts of the body. And a beta blocker is a medication that used to be used for blood pressure control, but is often used for other reasons now such as if someone has chest pain or history of heart disease. My advice for you would be uh, there can be interactions with certain herbs and Xarelto. Like uh, it would be important. I would recommend just talking to your healthcare provider or to an anticoagulation clinic if you're followed by them to just make sure that you're not eating anything that interacts. But one thing is Xarelto doesn't have the same problem that warfarin or coumadin does with leafy green vegetables. So there's no drug interaction there, but certain other herbs can interact with it. So really important to check with your healthcare provider um, and make sure that's okay. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will log each and every one that comes in and try to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. Uh, Dr. Rahman, I can't let you go uh, without also talking about the Barnard Medical Center, because just as we were going to air, you told me something very exciting is mm -hmm. that the roster of states where telemedicine is available uh, has expanded. We now have Illinois among the states where you can see patients. That's right, Chuck. Uh, we can now see patients in Illinois and Georgia and Florida. So these are three new additions. So we're really excited to provide our services to patients in these states. Absolutely. And because it's telemedicine, that means you don't even need to leave the comfort of your own home. You can have this appointment in your pajamas. I'm assuming that you have had appointments with patients while they're still in their pajamas. Well, I, I don't know. I wouldn't ask, but I've had, <laughs> patients have looked very comfortable during their telehealth visits. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay. So uh, here's the deal. If you would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Ramon or any one of our doctors and dietitians, you can do that right now by visiting barnardmedical.org or by calling 202-527-7500. As you just heard Dr. Ramon say, uh, services now available in Illinois, Chicago, uh, which is huge. Also, the state of Georgia and Florida, California, New York, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Kentucky, any one of those locations, our doctors and dietitians should be able to meet with you. So log on to barnardmedical.org today or call 202-527-7500 to schedule your appointment. Dr. Rahman, greatly appreciate your time as always. Thanks for stopping by today. Thank you, Chuck. All right. And there is a new episode of the Exam Room podcast that is out today, revisiting the conversation that I had with Dr. Kim Williams on yesterday's episode of the Exam Room Live. But then also, exclusive to the podcast, you will have the opportunity to meet Laura Sines. And Laura, before the age of 25, 25 
she found that her health was in shambles. We're talking about she had Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, arthritis, and that is just the start. And her journey back to health is a long and winding one. It goes from that corporate life where she was very successful to now a life of helping others and adopting a plant-based diet and kicking those conditions to the curb. And believe it or not, believe it or not, Laura's journey, the first seed for it was planted many moons ago while she was watching an episode of The Simpsons. That may be a first. It's an incredibly inspiring story, guaranteed to give you the feels, as they say. So head over to the uh, Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available. Look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button. And if you would be so kind as to also leave a five-star rating, we would greatly appreciate it. Before we head out today, my thanks again to Dr. Columbus Batiste for joining us and the staff that makes the magic happen behind the scenes. Our director is Donna Steele and our producer is Laura Anderson. On behalf of Dr. Vanita Rahman and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And until tomorrow, please remember, take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based.